morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. <laughs> Bonjour tout le monde. Ah, ça devrait marcher beaucoup mieux comme ça. Bonjour tout le monde. Merci beaucoup. So we're all nice, wide awake, bushy-tailed. Excellent. Um, announcements this morning. Uh, we're a little bit uh, late giving people time to find the door to the ballroom this morning. Um, so that's good. Uh, we're going to begin the morning uh, with, you'll, you can all see your program, so I won't belabor the point, but we're starting out with a panel um, made up of folks from DG Space, including Brigadier General Whale. Thank you for coming today. Uh, who will uh, be leading that panel, and it will be moderated by Jacques Juhu. Uh, we'll then break for coffee. Um, the last technical session will follow. Uh, and then lunch today will be um, from noon until 2. Uh, our luncheon speaker is uh, Lucy Stoyak. She's here with us this morning. Uh, welcome, Lucy. And um, so we'll look forward to hearing what Lucy has to say. The title of her presentation will be Space Advisory Board Update and the Road Ahead. So I think we'll all want to hear what Lucy has to say. At 2 o'clock, uh, or whenever lunch is over, um, we will... Uh, well, that will be the formal conclusion of the conference, but um, those fortunate enough to have signed up, and there's still time to do it, will be going on a trip to ABB. Uh, transportation will be provided uh, to get you there. Um, a number of you will be going, I know, will be going on to the airport from ABB, so you will make your own arrangements for that transportation, um, or you will have your own cars or something, and you'll just leave. Uh, in the case of those who need to come back to the airport, uh, if you'd like us to see if we can make those arrangements for you, or at least to make sure there's a cab at ABB for you, please let us know between now and lunchtime. Uh, so that is, uh, that's, those are the announcements for this morning. And Jacques, uh, over to you. Thank you, Jeff. Welcome, everybody. So, um, we are having to, to start the, the, the morning a panel from uh, DG Space. Um, so let me introduce our, our panelists. So first, uh, Brigadier General Kevin Whale uh, is the Director General and Component Commander Space. Um, then Lieutenant Colonel Catherine Marchetti is Director for Space Strategy and Plans. And finally, Colonel Cameron Stoltz is Director for Space Requirements. Um, you all have been uh, appointed very recently, last year, so I think the timing is very good for getting an update uh, from you, and uh, we are very grateful that you could arrange for this panel discussion. So I think I'll turn it over to you. Yep, thank you very much. So we're here this morning to share with you what I think is a remarkable story. Um, this is a story that has been built uh, for the past decade or two, but it didn't cross a government level awareness until last year with the release of Strong, Secure, Engaged, uh, our new defense policy. Um, when I hear conversations about how we can reach Canadians to make sure they understand these kinds of stories, I'm kind of a poster child of the challenge. I'm a helicopter pilot by trade, spent three decades in the Air Force benefiting every day of my career from space-based capabilities. I never gave them a moment's thought until a year ago when I stepped into this assignment. Uh, that's something that we're trying to fix internally, and it's something that we're trying to add our voice externally uh, to the Canadian public. Uh, so I'm gonna share uh, our story with you today. Uh, I would appreciate that it's definitely an opportunity to do so. Um, I'm gonna do the first part. I'm gonna hand over to Catherine for in the middle and then uh, Colonel Stoltz is going to carry on with the, the project stuff at the end. Uh, this quote from the U.S. Chief of Staff of the Air Force in the United States kind of sums up what we're trying to do uh, within the military uh, to change our culture to space is no longer just an enabler uh, that operational for forces benefit from. Uh, it's now something that needs defending just like any other part of our capability. So we want to build joint smart space forces, uh, space force personnel 
and Space Smart Joint Force personnel. And we're doing our part to make that happen in Canada. I'm going to talk about the four C's, uh, what we're referring to as the four C's. You probably heard three. We're adding a, a fourth, and I'll explain why. Uh, we'll talk about Strong, Secure, Engage, the defense policy that was released last year, and specifically those space elements that were uh, remarkably and thankfully in, uh, included. Uh, the RCAF Defense Space Program, where we're at in taking this over as an Air Force, uh, as functional leadership for the capabilities, and then current and future capabilities. 60 years ago, as everybody in this room knows, uh, there was nothing up in space that was man-made. Uh, but Canada was the, the third country to put something in space uh, with our, along with our US ally. I had no idea. And this is how I perceived space. I knew that we were doing more in space. I knew there was communications and GPS systems and those kind of things. Um, but myself and a lot of Canadians haven't woken up from this point. So the first C that we now understand is the congested piece, which I think most people in this room understand. But I'm going to try to give you the military context for this. So over 1,500 active satellites, I heard this week, maybe as many as 800. It's changing, it's changing every month. We're tracking probably upwards of 23, 25,000 uh, uh, items of concern, probably the size of your fist or bigger. And of course, there's over about 500,000 pieces, parts of things up there that we really wish we were tracking. The assessments that I've heard is we're tracking somewhere around the, the highest number I've heard is about 20% of what we'd really like to be tracking. 20% of what's really a concern. If I gave that number to, an, uh, to one of my commanders that, that's relying on airspace control, um, I'd probably be relieved of my post. Okay? So we have to raise our game in understanding what's going on in space. And if you look at the chart in the, in the, uh, in the upper right, that's an illustration of the GeoInt satellites that are currently on orbit. And the red line just off to the right, that's 2018. That's what we know that is on orbit now. With the plans that, are, that we're aware of, this is what's coming. Okay? That's just the plans we're aware of, presuming that all these plans roll out. That's just the GeoInt satellites. There's also, of course, SATCOM, all the PNT satellites, Missile warning, weather, all the tech demos, all the CubeSats, all the microsats, okay? Uh, with the number of active satellites predicted to go, of course, above 10,000 and all the pieces ports that that means. So to say that we have to raise our game in uh, space situation awareness would certainly be an understatement. Uh, and when you rely on these capabilities to the extent that uh, the armed forces do, uh, it's certainly something that we have to, this, this, this C uh, really resonates with we gotta raise our game. The second one is contested. We've been operating in space uh, for longer than I've been alive uh, with no real concern other than, other than the environment and uh, I, think, I think there's been about what, four collisions in, in, in history. Um, some countries have had capabilities to reach out to touch space capabilities but it really wasn't a huge issue uh, until recently. Now all of this is a real concern. Uh, the 2007 uh, anti-satellite launch uh, from China that instantly created about 3,000 pieces of space debris uh, was a, was a wake-up call. That was 10 years ago. So in an unclassified forum, um, you can imagine what's happened in 10 years. Uh, there's things that we probably can't talk about in this room. Laser dazzling of sensors, uh, either, either just to temporarily blind a satellite or potentially to do damage. Uh, things launch from aircraft, lasers uh, from, launch from aircraft. Pretty easy to jam a SATCOM signal. Uh, during the Arab Spring, SATCOM jamming on the African continent went up something like 600%. I think that's against UN convention and yet it happened anyway. So talk about norms in space and things that happen and how we need to enforce it. Uh, uh, certainly a concern. Uh, and then probably the biggest concern is the cyber threat. Everything in space is a computer operating on a one and a zero. So I'll be honest with you, if I wanted to affect someone's satellites in space, uh, I don't know why I'd go through all the trouble of launching metal up into space and big obvious uh, uh, movement, uh, maneuver when I could probably just do something uh, covert uh, on the cyber side. Uh, we're concerned about all of this stuff, uh, all of these risks. 
And the third C, which this room is very clear on, is the competitive and commercialization piece. Space mining, exploration, uh, high altitude balloons with comm systems on them, on orbit servicing, lunar gateways. There's over, what, 80 countries now I heard this week uh, operating in space. Space is bringing the cost of launch down. This means so many things uh, um, that this room is very much aware of. It also means things like, uh, and I believe it was mentioned earlier, um, we have to adapt, uh, the military has to adapt how we're integrating with commercial uh, capabilities. The US Joint Space Ops Center, which my space ops center is linked with 24 and seven, now has a commercial integration cell. So there's an individual that's in the ops center. It's not somebody on the end of a phone. It's not looking through a contract to see the, what the comp companies have promised to provide. There's someone in the ops center that when things start happening in space, I think there's seven companies that have contracted through uh, this one representative uh, to be their voice embedded in operations in a classified operations center. That's the level of integration that we have to get comfortable with. Uh, this brings with it some nuanced issues that we need to try to deal with. Uh, some of our projects uh, that, that Colonel Stoltz is gonna talk about could be provided by a public-private partnership. Maybe cheaper, maybe faster. Uh, but is there a bigger strategic effect by putting up one or two Canadian satellites with a big Canada flag on the side saying Canada has provided these satellites? Or as opposed to, we've bought this service and we'll share it with you. So from a strategic, strategic military and political point of view, do you get the same strategic cachet uh, with a managed service as you do with, this is a Canadian satellite? So those are the, that's an example of the kind of thing uh, kind of things this slide means that we need to get our, our, our heads around and we're doing so. Uh, but it certainly means, it certainly adds to the, uh, the first two C's, uh, if nothing else. The fourth C is the convergence of all those, of those three. Uh, any one of those on its own should be motivation enough to establish a sense of urgency to raise our game. But the convergence of all those three at once uh, means a bunch of things. So what's it mean? It means opportunity, right? Which this room is very focused on. Cost of entry dropping, game-changing innovation, if not disruptive innovation. Uh, I know there's, there's uh, capabilities on orbit now that can do video from space. Um, we might still be thinking of focusing on UAVs and, and air platforms. Uh, technology transfer, all of the stuff that those innovations mean for Canadians uh, and others. Of course, the economic development, uh, that our country certainly should want to be a part of, interplanetary explanation, and it means, from a military point of view, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm simplifying here, but basically we can see, see and hear almost anything, uh, and, and that's improving every day. The risk is, every time I get briefed by a, comp by a company and I get excited about the, the, uh, the R&D work that, that, that they're, they're moving forward on, about 30 seconds later, I get afraid because if I can have this capability, there's others that can have that capability over top of my country as well. So the adversary access to space is growing just as quickly as ours. Innovation is far outstripping policy and procurement uh, practices. Collisions and counter space activity from the first two Cs. Freedom of maneuver uh, is no longer a guarantee. Uh, enforcement of those treaties and norms. I'm currently looking at it uh, I'm using an analogy of the international laws of the sea. It's taken us a couple, uh, couple hundred years to work out kind of those norms and expected behaviors, even though the, the, the treaties and such have been around for a long time. They've been around in space, we haven't really exercised them. So now we're exercising them, uh, either on purpose or by accident, and uh, it, we're, we're gonna have to go through that same kind of process. If we can see everything, they can see everything. And the example I use is, if you're uh, in the Navy right now, how do you move your weapon system anywhere on this planet without anyone on the internet knowing? Um, that's an example. So all those Cs, uh, as we were developing the defense policy, uh, resonated right up to cabinet level. Every country can benefit from space-based capabilities, but Canada in particular. We have the second largest landmass on this planet, and we have the population roughly of California. So to say that we can benefit from space capabilities for surveillance, navigation, communication, um, again, 
would be an understatement. Pretty compelling uh, context. And these are all the capabilities that I've benefited from my entire career and never gave a moment's thought to. Missile warning, ISR, precision strike, uh, weather, uh, capabil specific capabilities like being able to detect IED uh, locations, communications, navigation, surveillance, uh, uh, the C3 systems. Um, again, never gave it a moment's thought. These are no longer a given and we can't operate without them. We're completely dependent. Uh, so if they're at risk, we need to do th something to protect those, that capability. So the process that, that defense went through over more than a year and a half was uh, an assessment of the security environment, articulation of what are the Canadian interests related, uh, development of a vision for defense, determination of the roles and missions that are required to, to fulfill that, what are the required capabilities, what are the gaps in the future needs, uh, an unbelievably robust investment plan, uh, and then what kind of a Canadian forces do we need to be relevant to the government and to Canadians. Year and a half, hundreds of consultations all across the country, academia, uh, uh, government, subject matter experts, military, non-military allies, uh, an unbelievable level of work over a year and a half. It came out to all these things, I'm not gonna go through them all, uh, but if you look at the lower right, there was definitely a recognition that uh, issues in technology development and cyber and space were gonna be a big deal to how we're moving forward. And it came out to, we need to be strong at home, secure in North America and engaged in the world. And if you look at that red band across all three of those, space touches every single one of those. Every single one of them. The overall approach is we wanna be better, we know we need to be better at anticipate, adapt and act as strategic functions. And everything circled in red there has either direct or indirect uh, ties to space-based capabilities. And if you look at the bottom right, those eight mission sets that we identified that we need to be able to do, some of those are concurrent, some are not, some are sustained, some are not. We've always had these kind of lists at the strategic level in the armed forces. This is the first time the government signed a policy document that said, I need you to be able to do those things. And some of them at the same time under these conditions. If you add up that level of ambition, that's, that's a, a force deployed potentially that we haven't seen since the Korean conflict. We are not there right now. We cannot do all those missions concurrently. But we have a 20 year plan now to get us there uh, for the space piece based on those forces uh, and the, the regional or the geopolitical context that I mentioned earlier, before. So it comes out to all of these things. Again, I'm not gonna go through it all. I could summarize it by increasing the budget over 20 years by 70%, which, which equates to going from 0.9% of GDP to about 1.4% of GDP. In red there are the specific space elements. Uh, and I'm gonna get uh, Lieutenant Colonel Marchetti to talk about some of the specific objectives. But before I do that, I want you to understand the magnitude of this plan. You'll see the people piece, which is enormous. We gotta fix how we're supporting, retaining, recruiting, uh, dealing with our, our, our people. We gotta invest in these capabilities, including space, uh, and modernize the way we're running our business. Uh, that is a 20 year plan, and if you think of a box that has the accrual envelope of available funding over 20 years, there's only so much you can expend each year. All of these projects, if you think of them like kind of the size of marbles, fighter replacement, ships, the people initiatives, the space projects. You gotta fit all those mar sorry, you gotta fit all those marbles into that box. And in some case I get asked questions, well, your space project X, it's not till 2020 whatever, why so late? Well, because there's a lineup of going from 0.9 to 1.4% of GDP, there's a, there's a 20 year plan that has to be dealt with. And if I use a treasury board example, let's say treasury board could consume, I don't know, I think it's less than 100 treasury board submissions a year that they can pump through their pipeline. Defense could eat up all of that alone if no other government department put in a treasury board submission with this kind of a plan. To the point where uh, they're looking at things like having days dedicated to just defense programs so that treasury board's not the limit uh, as we're trying to move forward on this. So some of our projects are not 
where I want them operationally, but they are where they fit in that 20 year plan. We need some strategic discipline right now with the plan just being rolled out to stick to that plan until things start to shift. So, and they, and they probably will at some point. I want my space projects to be ready to slide left and we're gonna design them that way. So if other projects uh, start to slide for whatever reason, I want our space projects to be ready to move to the left. And with that, I think I'll hand it over to Catherine to talk about the specific space uh, elements in the policy. So good morning, everyone. So John Well provided a really good overview of the overall plan. And you know, space is one piece. As you know, we still have to buy ships and planes and army trucks and all, all that other piece. So it looks like a lot of money, but you know, it's, uh, it's all relative, right? But we do have space for spa space, for space, I guess, uh, in that plan, which is, uh, which is uh, somewhere we haven't been in many, many, many years, if ever. Now, some of the specifics, so within the, our asset, what we call the SSC, the, our uh, defense policy, uh, there's a, a list of initiatives. So if, uh, I mean, it's available online, if uh, I would encourage everybody to have a look, but there is specific initiative, even just for space. So basically we're giving the direction to me to go ahead and use that, make a plan to address those initiatives. We've been working on space project and some R&D for, for years, even without you know, a formal plan and all that, we knew those were essential. So we just kept you know, a little bit trying to push along because we knew they were essential. What was new with this policy is the, uh, the realization that we need to defend and protect our space capability or how do we ensure that we always have access? So there's different ways of doing this and we are working on a plan to uh, try to do that working with, uh, with our, the OGDs, with our allies. I'll expand on that a little bit later, but really this is the key piece that was really we were never directed to do before. Uh, invest in the employer range of space capability and I'll let uh, Colonel Stoll is gonna go into a lot more details uh, later on, on on what that means. But now another one is to work with partners to promote Canada's national interest on space issues. So internally, I mean, uh, this is you know the overall initiative, but there's significant amount of strategic engagement that needs to be happening in the space domain. We have like, there's I'd say like three levels. There's in even internally because although the, all the work leading up to the policy has really increased the awareness of the important space even within uh, the armed forces, uh, there's still a lot of engagement with our different uh, other internal organization. So, you know, with the user communities, with the operational communities, uh, with our uh, policy folks as well, because we're really aligned in everything as we're moving forward. Then the second level is working with the other government department. Uh, you know, the Canadian Space Agency, of course. Uh, there's a Global Affairs Canada. I said uh, PSPC, which is a, I can never remember, it's the, the Procurement Service Canada. Uh, there's, there's an Arcan, so we're working with all of those, well, all the Transport Canada as well. So pretty much all the, government, the other government department, and we have like regular interaction to, uh, sit down and what's the, the government's position, how can we work together, uh, increase interest on, on our different mandates, and really how can we best position Canada. So this is quite significant amount of work uh, ongoing. And then, and then finally the third, the third level is with our allies. Uh, like you saw, like the, the strong at home, secure in North America, so this is working with our American uh, ally. And then uh, there's a lot of different engagement going on uh, in, in that realm. And then uh, with the five, what we call the five eyes. So this is Canada, US, UK, Australia, and New Zealand. So significant amount of work on, under that through our, uh, some of you might have heard the combined space uh, operation initiative. Uh, how can we work together in space to uh, ensure we have access to our capability and, and really, uh, um, in ensure that we can protect the space environment, that we can still all use it. And then uh, more recently, there's also engagement with France, Germany, Japan. I mean, it, it's, it's increasing uh, 
maybe not every day, but it, it's increasing because really we need to all work together in the space domain because it's truly a global domain. Uh, providing, we have initiative to provide leadership in shaping international norms of responsible behavior in space. Because like, uh, uh, like uh, General Whale mentioned, it's absolutely essential that we have access to those capability to fulfill our mandate. So uh, we have a role to play, you know, so we're working uh, side by side, uh, again, with the, the space agency, GAC, you know, and some of the effort on the UN QPUS. Uh, there are, we're working with our allies uh, on the policy side to see, you know, how can we help shape those norms to make sure that the space environment remain uh, available to all. Uh, we also, and then there's an initiative to con specifically to conduct cutting edge R&D on new space technologies. So DG Space doesn't do R&D per se. We work closely with the uh, DRDC. Uh, many of you who know some of the key folks that we work with in this area, but we really need to be better. Like we have our main key project, flagship, what I would call uh, coming on, and there are in the investment plan, but in between, like how can we leverage all the all the innovation, all the amazing concept, business models that the commercial industry is coming up with, and then how can we work also with the uh, with the um, leveraging what's going on in the in the uh, university, in the academic world, uh, you know, to try to come up with those new concepts and how can we integrate those with uh, our operation? Because that's, that's the other piece, right? It's nice to have some amazing capability, but how do we make our, the user community, right? The operators really uh, see what that can do for them. So we're trying to bridge those gaps uh, using leveraging some of the, the work ongoing in the, in the Air Force side, you know, because they've been used for years to come up with <coughs> you know, coming up with innovation and working with industry and the RDC and then transferring that into operations. So how can we do that better on, on the space side? Because uh, as, as you all know, on the commercial side, it's, uh, it's exponential. Like it, the growth in, in types of data services, it's, uh, it's, quite, uh, it's quite amazing to see that and how can we leverage that to help us fulfill our mandate. And of course, what's not, it's not specifically stated there, but under all that, we need to develop our joint space force. We need to develop our cadre. Like we need to have more than, what, like 60 people working in specifically in space and defense. We need to have people thinking about space as they're uh, developing a concept, they're developing their exercise. What can space do to, to support us? So uh, that's gonna take, a, doesn't, Come overnight, but uh, this is something as well that uh, we're going to be actively looking in the in the coming months. So, uh, this next slide. So, just a little bit uh, more about that. What we mean by defend and protect. Those of you who were at the space resiliency workshop on Monday, I gave a little bit more details to <coughs> maybe demystify like what 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 do we mean by that? But it's really about are the space mission assurance. How can we ensure that we have access to the capability that we need? And there's different ways of doing this. Uh, there's, of course, the defensive side. Again, how can you protect a, a satellite through uh, network protection, some hardware? There's different ways of doing this. There's the rock institution. So, I mean, if you lose an asset, you just launch another one. It sounds easy to say, but as you know, it's not quite a that easy, uh, but there's still a, a way that uh, to, to help ensuring your mission assurance and their resiliency. And that's where you see a lot of different, uh, different ways that you can achieve resiliency. Uh, I'm not gonna go into detail on in all of those, but just so you know that we're looking at not just the spacecraft, but the whole system. We're looking at how, again, how do we ensure we have access to those space capability, either through the commercial side, with the allies, is it just launching another one, using the commercial side, so that's where uh, we need to evolve and, and look at that into more detail, uh, again, the coming months, coming years. So I mentioned, like, I mean, because we have all these plans, but we're really aligned with the policy side. We're really, you know, making sure we don't break any treaties, of course. It's like it's any, uh, any area that defense is Im implicated with. Like this is, 
you know, there's the overall treaties, there's different regulatory mechanism, and, and we are trying to uh, improve the, the space-related regulatory regime, uh, and that doesn't happen overnight, but there's effort there that we're supporting. Uh, so we have all this, we have our policy, there's now, a, we've developed a space doctrine note, there's gonna be a full doctrine, so doctrine's how we, we operate uh, in space and with the space domain. And then there's the, you know, the Canada's police policy framework and what's gonna be coming, because we believe that we'll need at some point to have some kind of document or some kind of direction that will really help guide where Canada goes and that def on the defense will be able to bring our peace and then supporting the, those efforts. Because uh, as, uh, as the DG mentioned, like even just on the defense side, it took a long time to get to where we are, but when we believe that it's the right thing to do, then you know we go, we try to advance a little bit and just uh, making small progress. So uh, I think that's my uh, mm -hmm. slide. Great. Thank you. So this is this is the mission of uh, my position and my team. So certainly space domain awareness, and, and then that develop, deliver, and assure those space-based capabilities all fo focused on joint warfighter effects. This is what my organization looks like. So this was built under, uh, under a joint organization, but it got to the point where it really needed a, an environment like the Air Force to wrap its arms around it. Um, my position is dual-hatted. I'm the Director General of Space. I'm also a component commander to the operational commander. So if I talk about the component commander function, so I'm linked with commanders NORAD, uh, Special Forces Ops Command and our Joint Ops Command, both in making sure that they're getting the space effects that they, the best space effects that we can deliver or coordinate on their behalf, and understanding the operational requirements so that when we're building new projects, those operational requirements of all those commanders are embedded in our operational requirements. On the DG side, uh, if you look, um, I guess right to left, so force development, in the middle, force generation, and on the left, force employment. So force development, that's Colonel Stoltz Department with a uh, ISR and SATCOM team working on um, project uh, leadership on uh, projects. In the center is Catherine's teams with strategic engagement. Uh, this team has, we did an audit of all the, the internal and external national and international engagements that, that we are asked to participate in. There's 300 per year. Uh, we're trying to rationalize that down to to the ones that we can manage. Uh, the space plans, the research and development, and the force generation of that joint space cadre that Catherine talked about. Uh, you'll see a little, dot, little dotted box there with the NORAD uh, OutCan for out of Canada folks. So there's about 30 folks that don't report to me. They're, they're under the NORAD. They've been wor working in the, under the NORAD arrangement for a long time, um, um, spread out through different uh, elements throughout the US uh, forces focused on space business. Uh, and then the left director of space operations and readiness. So that's my Canadian Space Operations Center with operations, a 24 and seven space watch, uh, uh, JSST's joint space support teams. Uh, that could be uh, like one individual that we send out with deployed forces. So that when anybody has a question on space, they turn to that individual and let that individual links back into my space op center, my TANS BOC, uh, and back into all the five eyes and plus capabilities that we're linked in with. Uh, standards and readiness, operational analysis, and NAVWAR that I'll talk, uh, I think Cam's gonna talk about. That's about 60 people in uniform doing all that stuff. Uh, I've been given about an extra 22 positions in uniform uh, starting this year, and about 120 uh, civilian positions that we're gonna add from 2019 on over about eight years. Uh, so we're almost tripling the size of our space cadre with a significant civilian component, uh, largely for, uh, for reasons of uh, continuity and, and uh, corporate knowledge. So we get folks in space, rather than rotating them through, we'll get some folks in those space-based capabilities uh, that can stay there for a longer period of time. I used to say uh, that's not many people to be doing all the stuff that we're working on, but that's not the only people in defense that are working on space. So we're referred to as the defense space enterprise, so that wider enterprise, now you've got the Air Force in the middle uh, with my team as the core. Uh, if you look at the upper left, so you got the Space Ops Center linked in with the operational communities, uh, the King Forces Integrated Command Center uh, in the east end of Ottawa and, and with links to the Government Ops Center. So when things like 
uh, the Chinese Tiangong One reentry. My team was linked to, with allies tracking that, and we were feeding the feeding the government ops center on whether it was a concern for Canada or not. Uh, the link to those uh, joint space support teams and deployed forces, of course, and then everything to the right, uh, up to the r upper right with allies, the Canadian space or combined space ops organization. So Five Eyes partners working together on space business with France, Germany, and Japan. Uh, working to, uh, to integrate as well. Obviously the industry partners, uh, all the links with Space Agency, I said Public Safety, Global Affairs, NRCAN, uh, a lot of horizontal engagement there. And everything in the bottom right, that purple circle, Army, Navy, Air Force folks, some of them embedded in my team, uh, the PSPC, the Chief Force Development, our Information Management Group actually owns the Satellite Operations Center in the bottom of the Defense Headquarters in Ottawa. So. We work on the, com the projects and once they go into implementation, they're handed over to the information management group. Uh, CF Intelligence Command, so all the imagery is coordinated through CF Intelligence Command, which we support uh, their efforts. Uh, DRDC, Research Canada, we have a, a sensor system ops center in 22 wing in North Bay dealing with uh, Sapphire uh, data transfer. And then what we now call the Barker Center, so we have a school in Winnipeg. Part of their training is basic and advanced operations for Air Force wide. Uh, we're doing, a, I've asked Catherine to do an audit right now of how many folks that inc includes. It's probably, it's certainly in the hundreds. I'm not sure what the number is going to work out to, but we're now the sort of orchestration point uh, for all of that. And then my space operations center, which is really focused on space domain awareness, 24 and 7, uh, with links to the, the Joint Space Ops Center in the US. Uh, sending out those teams, the operational analysis, plans and exercises, the mission assurance piece day to day, and then the standards and training. On the right, they've got a, a lot of different software tools that we uh, collaborate with allies on, and then links to those other ops centers. And now I'm going to hand it over to Colonel Stoltz. Okay, thank you, General Well. Uh, <clears throat> before I start, uh, I first wanted to say uh, congratulations to everyone uh, making it here this morning, uh, day three, especially after the, uh, the gala dinner last night. I wanted to also add my congratulations to the to winners last night. Uh, all of you, it was, uh, was eye-opening for me and uh, to see the, uh, the level of effort and the work that has gone on in the, uh, in the Canadian industry and, uh, and government. It was, uh, it was very encouraging to see. This is my first uh, Astro Conference, and uh, to be honest, I didn't really know uh, what to expect, but I've been uh, very, uh, very pleasantly surprised. And I'd like to thank all those people who have uh, who've put this together. First of all, the, uh, the, the, Cassie, uh, the Cassie Group and ADB, but also all the uh, presenters all week long, uh, not just the main presenters, but the, uh, the technical breakout groups and all the other people that I've uh, interacted with uh, during the week. It was, uh, it was quite impressive. I've, I've learned a, a considerable amount, so, uh, so thank you very much. Just wanted to give a, a bit of a background about myself before I begin. So this is really, over the last year, is my first real hard, uh, hard um, job dealing with space. I'm a communications officer uh, by trade. So I've, I've done a lot of uh, work in the past in SATCOM, satellite communications. So it was actually a very good fit as well talk a bit more about uh, my portfolio. Uh, on the, uh, the SATCOM side, I was uh, fairly comfortable, but certainly a lot of uh, learning to go uh, that I had to go through on the ISR side to learn about uh, surveillance of space and surveillance from space. So it's uh, gatherings like this and conferences and, and the people around the room who've helped me, helped me learn and develop over the last year. So as uh, General Well mentioned, I'm uh, responsible for force development. So to start out this conversation, I just wanted to give you an idea of what the project framework looks like that I'm dealing with, uh, that we deal with in D&D uh, &D and uh, the RCF. So along the, uh, the left-hand side, you'll see what we need, all need to follow in D&D. It's the defense procurement strategy that's broken into five distinct phases, as you can see there. And about halfway through, you'll see a line going parallel, and that's the uh, project leadership transition. So on the top and the bottom are two distinct groups. On the top is, uh, is what we refer to as the sponsor, and they're essentially the, the project directors. They're the ones responsible to, uh, one of the key roles is to gather the inputs from, from all the different users. We represent the users. We're not necessarily uh, 
the only users of the, uh, of the capabilities that we're trying to require. So the sponsor and the project directors. Below that transition line is uh, the implementers or the, um, the uh, project managers. Think of them as that. As we move through the phases and are ready to go to RFP and to, to build and implement the project, that's where it switches. So there's actually a role called the project leader and that project leader role switches as we move as we move into the later stages. Both groups are, are important in, in all phases, but the, the emphasis changes as we move throughout the, uh, the project. Uh, General Whale mentioned that we've recently uh, moved the, uh, the mandate for, for space into the RCAF. Uh, it's been official for about a year now, unofficial for about two. So what that means is that uh, the RCF essentially has stewardship for, for, the, uh, space, uh, for the space capability and the space role. But when I'm thinking about uh, projects and projects delivery, deliveries, um, I think of that as stewardship because it's not just the RCF that we're representing. It's uh, we're, we're doing these projects and developing and delivering these capabilities for the joint warfighter. And uh, that's, uh, that's seen as well when you, if you happen to come through our lines, it's not just uh, RCF people. I've got uh, Navy personnel and Army personnel as well, as well in, uh, in the organization and without, within DG Space. And they're key to bring those different outlooks and expertise to the role. So within the RCAF, there's actually two groups that do uh, force development. Uh, one is uh, General Wales Group, uh, DG Space. And uh, the force development arm rests, uh, rests with me and the projects that I'll talk about. But as you saw, he does more than just, uh, than just force development. It's one of the three, uh, the three areas that, uh, that he talked about. The other one, uh, the other gen director general is Director Ger General uh, Air Force Development, uh, General Lalimere. And he's responsible for uh, the platforms. So if you think of the, uh, the aircraft, the fighters, all the, the platforms that we're delivering, he's responsible for force development. The difference though is he's just responsible for force development. He does have you know, quite a large portfolio, but it's force development only. So there's a, a bit of a nuance there. As we move down into the, into the second uh, or the bottom part of the slide, the, as we transition into the implementer and the project managers, uh, a difference as well. For uh, the Air Force Development side, uh, General Lalimiere's group, um, their implementer is ADMAT, uh, the Materiel Group. Whereas for the space projects, we're, uh, we have a different implementer, and that's uh, the ADM for Information Management. There is a slight nuance there that we still do have linkage to ADMAT because they're still our procurement authorities, but as far as the implementers go, there is a difference. And as far as on the, uh, the far right side, we've also noted their uh, CSA and uh, the civil space side. So there is certainly um, linkages between uh, DG Space and uh, CSA. And I'd say that that linkage exists when it makes sense, mutually makes sense for it to exist. And I'll give you a couple examples. Probably the one that's, uh, that most people are going to recognize is, is RCM. So uh, the Radarsat Constellation mission is a whole of government uh, project led by CSA that uh, obviously we've uh, contributed to and are very much looking forward in, in taking part in that uh, under the lead of CSA. Uh, another example is CSA has uh, currently runs our AIS, our Automated Identification System contract, and the plan is for them to uh, carry that on when it needs renewal in a couple of years and potentially with, uh, with uh, other government departments participating as well. The one that uh, I guess will need to be resolved over the coming uh, months and years will be the follow on to RCM. So uh, CSA has a project underway called uh, SAR DC, uh, Synthetic Aperture Radar Data Continuity that they're um, moving forward with as a follow on to RCM. And as I'll talk about, we've got a project called uh, DESPI, Defense uh, Enhanced Surveillance from Space Project. And uh, the interaction between these two projects at this point is unknown. As General Whale likes to say, it could be anywhere from uh, zero to 100% and that'll uh, develop over time. And uh, as you can imagine, um, the, uh, the requirements of D&D are not necessarily the same requirements as, uh, as the rest of the government departments. Uh, we've got a, a worldwide mandate uh, dealing with allies, certain security issues. 
uh, that may not uh, be the same for the rest of the government department. So we're certainly going to explore what those opportunities are and take advantage of them where they exist. Um, but at this time, there is, uh, there is no clear answer on, on how that's going to develop. So we throw this slide up here because uh, one of the things that we find um, is that uh, when we talk about space projects, there seems to be a focus primarily on what you're putting up in the sky, the satellite or whatever platform you have. But uh, we throw this up here just to, to realize that it's, that it's more than, than uh, just the, uh, the bird up in the sky, right? First of all, you have to get it there and get it there successfully. Uh, command and control and uh, everything that goes along with that. You have to be able to uh, control, um, do your TTNC for your satellite. And then you've got to get it to the users, uh, whether these are the users deployed out in the field or uh, the users that are, for us, based in Ottawa or across Canada and through the infrastructure that exists there. And so um, where we often talk about uh, threats to the, um, to the satellite itself, whether that's from other players or the space environment or the growing debris. Uh, we also recognize that in, we're delivering a capability. We're not just potentially delivering a satellite. So we need to make sure that um, we're protected from jamming, we're protected from uh, cyber attacks, we're uh, physically protected, and uh, we need to have all these components working properly in order to have a functioning system and deliver a capability. We're not just delivering a satellite. So I'd like to start out um, by talking about uh, current capabilities. And the first one I have, uh, I'd like to talk about is uh, what we're using now for surveillance of space called our Sapphire project. So there's a couple of characteristics about uh, Sapphire that, uh, that make it unique. And one that's uh, particularly as important is that we are currently the only uh, space-based non-US contributor to the uh, space surveillance network. Which is, which is fantastic for us. It, uh, it actually brings a lot of political leverage and a lot of um, um, respect, I guess, for Canada by being able to do this. Uh, more importantly, it opens a lot of doors for us with the, with the US. We get uh, uh, privileged access, I guess you could say, to the, uh, to the space catalog because of our contributions. And uh, it's, uh, it's very important politically and strategically for Canada to have delivered and to be maintaining the uh, Sapphire project. I know it's early Thursday morning, but uh, for you always to be looking at the fine print on the slide there, you can probably do a little math and are, are, are probably wondering, if you take a look at the, the launch date in February 13, and then you take a look at the design life of five years, all right, I'm seeing a few eyes, uh, you know, people clicking now. So um, we're past design life in Sapphire, All right? We certainly expect it to continue for uh, hopefully a very long time, but uh, that is a challenge we have right now. We, we do have a gap and we're working very hard on the follow-on project for this capability um, to make sure that ideally there is no gap, but as well that if there is one that we minimize it to the, uh, to the greatest extent possible. Okay, the next uh, project I'm gonna talk about is called uh, Polar Epsilon. So Polar Epsilon is basically a, uh, a defense project that, um, that was designed to exploit the, uh, the data that we're receiving from, uh, from Radarsat 2. So its role is to provide uh, near real-time ship detection uh, using the Radarsat 2 data and so what, what we do is we take the, the imagery from uh, Radarsat 2 and we combine it with uh, AIS or the uh, Automated Identification System data and uh, combine this, this information to, uh, to do near, near real-time ship detection. So the idea is, uh, uh, Lieutenant Commander Kabat, I've talked about it in one of the, uh, the breakout sessions, but essentially um, if you picture uh, doing the maritime domain awareness job and trying to uh, trying to track ships, so you can get uh, images with the uh, with the radar, and you can also get uh, assuming that the ships have it turned on their information from the AIS, 
And what this software does, the uh, Polar Epsilon does, is it combines the two. And what we're really looking for is those targets that are um, we get a radar image from, but we can't correlate it with an AIS uh, uh, signal that's coming out, right? And that, uh, those are the ones, as you can imagine, there's, depending on the area we're looking at, there's, you know, uh, hundreds or thousands of potential targets uh, in the maritime area. And uh, the controllers and the operators need a way of filtering that down. So if you've got an image where you can see the ship, but it's not, um, but it's not uh, transmitting this AIS signal, it raises some questions. Why is it not transmitting AIS, right? Is it, uh, is it broken? Are they at anchor? Have they turned it off? Or are they trying to go undetected and turn off the AIS and not transmit? So this helps the, uh, the operators filter down and identify those targets that are of more interest and that the, uh, uh, the Naval Forces or the Coast Guard can investigate uh, more closely. One of the challenges um, with, uh, with Polar Epsilon or uh, one of the areas that we hope to improve on with, uh, with RCM is the fact that uh, at this point we're getting our AIS data from, uh, from a contracted resource. So there is, a, there is a lag in the time or there's a time difference between when we're receiving the, the SAR imagery and the AIS data which means it makes it harder to correlate those, uh, those targets. So this is something, as I'll talk about, that uh, we see improving greatly when we move to RCM. So now I'm going to talk about uh, some of the, uh, I, I guess all of the, uh, the SACOM projects that we currently have. And I'm going to start in the, uh, in the top left. It's a project that we called uh, Protected Mill SACOM. And essentially, it's Canada buying in to a U.S. government program called uh, Advanced DHF. And Advanced DHF is the, is the uh, most highly protected uh, satellite communication system that the, uh, the U.S. military uses. It's uh, anti-jam, low probability of intercept, low probability of detection. And, uh, but that comes with a, with a trade-off. And the trade-off is, uh, as you can imagine, that it's uh, lower data rate, lower throughput than you would because of all these additional features that are built in. So we, uh, Canada has bought in uh, a certain percentage. I believe it's about uh, three or four percent of the advanced uh, EHF system and uh, that we provide our taskings and uh, our configuration to the US and uh, get access to their satellites worldwide. The second system and the uh, top right, um, the program that we have is called a Mercury Global, but essentially it's our contribution to the American uh, Worldwide uh, Global System, or WGS. Now, it is uh, not the same as Advanced DHF, so it's really in between uh, the Advanced DHF and uh, what you probably get uh, from most commercial providers. So it does have more uh, it does have a level of protection, not the, uh, not the same amount as you get from the advanced DHF, but it does offer a, uh, a lot higher throughput in data rate available to the forces. So again, similar to what we did with the, uh, advanced DHF, Canada has basically bought in through an MOU and uh, contributed and uh, has a certain percentage, roughly about uh, 2 to 3% of the WGS constellation that we're able to access uh, worldwide. And how we do that is uh, the emblem on the bottom, the SOC, the uh, Satellite Operations Center. So that's um, uh, an organization that's run by our IM group. You may remember them as our implementers. And uh, they're the ones that coordinate all the, uh, the requests from the users across the CF. It all comes into our Satellite Operations Center. And they're the ones who do the, uh, the planning as required and are the liaison to the operations centers in the US to, uh, to coordinate our access to the particular satellites. One, uh, one other um, aspect of SATCOM that they do that I haven't talked about yet is the, uh, the narrowband or the UHF access. And uh, as you'll see, that's a, a project that I'm gonna talk about shortly, but our access to UHF right now is extremely limited. We do have uh, very occasional access to, uh, to what the US has but it's a very uh, oversubscribed service, and we essentially get um, limited access when we're a very high priority, essentially 
on an operational mission, we may get some access, but it's certainly a resource that's in uh, very high demand and hard for, for Canada to access right now from a military perspective. URSA stands for Unclassified Remote Sensing uh, Situational Awareness. It's essentially a uh, deployable terminal. We have, uh, we have two of them. And uh, as you might imagine, or as you can imagine by the, the title, it's unclassified. So the goal or the role of URSA is to access, uh, right now it's accessing uh, RadarSat2 data, but it also has the ability to, to collect and to access other commercial optical um, constellations as well. The key feature of URSA is that uh, we deploy it. Uh, one is deployed right now, for example, in Bahrain. It's deployed with the commander out in the field, and it's got the ability to access this unclass information essentially immediately. It can task and receive the information basically at the terminal now, at the terminal there, and that brings uh, two, um, two key advantages. First of all, you're essentially cutting out the middleman, and the, the time from flash to bang, I guess, is a lot quicker. The information can get in the hands of the, the analyst and the, uh, the commander quicker. And because it's unclassified, uh, we're able to share that information with our allies. There's no real limitations on what we can share. So we've got uh, two of those uh, systems right now, and they're in the process of, uh, uh, of being transferred um, organizationally to the RCAF. We go to 10? Sure. We have till 10? We do. I want to leave time for questions. Okay. I'm not going to, uh, well, as you saw in the org chart, uh, navigation warfare is not, uh, is not one of my topics, but um, I will go through it quickly. Uh, as you can imagine, the CAF depends heavily on PNT or position navigation and timing, and our adversaries uh, have, the have the ability to deny this access. The military uh, opposition could have high power jammers. There's also a risk from low power jammers that you can can get on the internet. So the NAVWAR program um, is really looking at uh, uh, tools of how we would uh, potentially work in a GPS degraded or de denied environment. Uh, they deal a, a lot uh, with MOUs and international agreements. They leverage a hundred million dollar R&D effort and uh, that is uh, the current uh, type of activities that uh, we deal with in NAVWAR. So now I'm going to talk about our future activities. Up here now you have the, uh, the RCAF Space Five-Year Roadmap. This came out before the defense policy was announced, so it needs uh, some fine-tuning. But for the, for the most part, when we look at the, uh, the force development side in the middle, they are uh, still match up quite well with what we're doing now. So the activities that I will particularly talk about are um, level of uh, line of effort uh, for ISR, which we talk about uh, surveillance from space and surveillance of space, as well as all the, uh, the SATCOM efforts is another uh, line of effort. And I will talk a bit uh, quickly about the, uh, the NAV war efforts as well. So the general mentioned that uh, one of his areas was the, uh, the Canadian Space Operations Centre, and there's a, a lot of areas where um, there's uh, possibilities for for enhancement and for improvement. We're certainly very proud of of where the CANSPOC is now, and it's and it's uh, it's doing a lot, uh, but there's also a lot of potential, and a lot of that potential comes from uh, cooperation and collaboration, not only with the U.S. but uh, with something called the uh, the Species SPOC, which is a Five Eyes Plus uh, organization. And uh, some of the, uh, the areas, uh, I'm not going to go through them all, but some of the areas that you can see there uh, where they're um, hoping to evolve over the coming years is to improve their, their mission system, uh, continue our cooperation and our uh, input into the space surveillance network, and increase our um, nav war capabilities. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about our future SATCOM projects. The first one I'm going to talk about is uh, the one on the left, and it's the, uh, the Tactical Narrowband SATCOM um, GEO, so uh, geosynchronous coverage. 
this is our narrowband or UHF project uh, that I was talking about. You recall a, a minute or so ago I talked about how difficult it is to, uh, to access UHF and uh, the narrowband access, which is essentially for, for, smaller, mover, for smaller users and uh, users on the move. So our, uh, our objective right now is to, to once again um, participate in a, uh, US, um, a U.S. project that's ongoing that's called uh, MUOS or the Multi-User Objective System. And MUOS is, uh, is a, based on a WCDMA um, concept and it's essentially, think of it as a, uh, a cell tower in the sky. And uh, this, the idea is for us to um, uh, again, participate with the uh, with the U.S. on our TNS project and their their U.S. program, and this will give us uh, worldwide UHF uh, coverage from 65 to 65 degrees. And uh, looking at the uh, uh, final operational capability in the uh, 22 23 time timeline, assuming everything goes well. The next project I'm going to talk about is the one on the right. That's the Enhanced uh, Satellite Communications Project, uh, Polar, or uh, what we commonly refer to as a SCAPE. So this is our, this is our Arctic project, and uh, a couple of uh, very interesting points about uh, the ESCAPE project. Um, first of all, it's going to be a combination of uh, narrowband and wideband, um, so that, uh, that'll be a little bit different. Uh, the other one too is we've got a lot of allied interest uh, right now. So previously we've received letters of intent from uh, the US, uh, Norway and Denmark and we've also got uh, recent interest from, from the UK as well. So it's going to be very interesting to see how these uh, arrangements uh, develop in the future. And what I think is particularly important about this project is that um, over the past few minutes you've uh, heard me talk about uh, getting access to three different, now three different uh, U.S. constellations. So this is uh, Canada's opportunity to, to take the lead and uh, to give back not only to the U.S. but potentially some of our other allies. So um, very important for us from a, um, from a technical perspective and giving us that capability we don't have right now in the Arctic, but also I think uh, strategically and politically to, to be a provider of SATCOM as opposed to, to being on the receiving end, I think is, uh, is very exciting. So um, the timelines for, for this project are um, looking at IOC around uh, 2029, but that, uh, um, that particular timeline is, uh, we hope to move forward and we'll see uh, how, we'll, how much success we'll have in moving that forward. As you can imagine, there's, uh, there's a lot of factors uh, one is uh, where we stand from uh, a budget point of view and our interaction with allies. Another key factor is the fact that we don't know how we're going to approach this uh, project right now. And it's interesting because just a couple of days ago, um, our initial RFI for, uh, for the escape project closed. And uh, we're looking forward to see what the responses are. Uh, and we anticipate spot responses ranging anywhere from uh, managed service options potentially up to design and build our, our own Canadian specific satellites. And as you can imagine, the, uh, the timelines associated with, uh, with uh, these different types of approaches are very different. So um, uh, we'll see how that uh, pans out with the RFI and as we move down through the process. And uh, uh, we've certainly got uh, as an objective to move those timelines as quick as forward as quick as we can. I just throw this up here quickly to talk about um, the SATCOM program, and I've I've talked to uh, to most of this already. But just this gives you an idea of how everything fits together. Uh, so I've talked about uh, the protected uh, advanced DHF uh, system, and we're looking at uh, likely following on with the Americans again uh, on a f uh, future uh, protected uh, system. The same with. Uh, uh, with uh, Mercury Global, which was our access to the, the uh, WGS system with the US. And uh, we're participating in looking to see what they do with Mercury Global next, their follow-on. Uh, TNS, I, uh, I talked to you about, and uh, that's the UHF narrowband side. 
and again, uh, likely following on with the Americans. And more importantly, well, not more importantly, but at the end, you'll see the, uh, the polar system that I just talked about uh, currently red because nothing exists, and hopefully seeing that go green as soon as possible with the escape program. Next, I'll talk quickly about uh, the uh, ISR projects. Uh, starting in the bottom left, uh, the MIOSAR project, you know, the Canada has got a, uh, a long history of participation in uh, uh, COSPAS SARSAT, and uh, this is the, uh, the next participation level of participation for Canada uh, in MIOSAR. We're putting up uh, right now some ground terminals, um, but more importantly, uh, a few years down the road, We've, uh, we've built repeaters that will be part of the, the GPS-3 launches, uh, 20 plus of those repeaters. The key point here is that uh, the only non-US uh, contributor to the GPS uh, system, uh, particularly on the satellites, uh, as you can imagine, very, very sensitive and protected about anything that goes on GPS because of its importance. So quite, a, uh, um, quite an accomplishment to be a part of uh, part of the GPS. Radar Sat Constellation mission, uh, we've already talked to that. I've already talked uh, about Polar Epsilon as well. So Polar Epsilon 2 is essentially a follow on to what I talked about f before with, with Polar Epsilon and uh, uh, doing that near real time ship detection. The advantage, uh, another key advantage for, for with RCM is the fact that uh, we've got an AIS payload right on board RCM. So there will be no lag that we currently have with the contracted AIS. So we expect a lot higher correlation and better returns as we do that processing of the information. I'll go down to the bottom and talk about uh, surveillance of space two. Essentially that's our follow on to, to the Sapphire project. Uh, right now I'll say that uh, we haven't decided on whether it's gonna be ground based, uh, space based or a combination of both. We're certainly uh, open at this stage and we're looking at uh, putting out our initial RFI for the follow-on to Sapphire uh, at some point later this year. And finally, um, I talked a bit about it already, our DESPI project. This is the defense project that, uh, that will be the follow-on to, to RCM. And as I mentioned before, as we move through uh, the program over the next, uh, next few years, we'll, uh, we'll determine you know, what overlap, if any, there will be between us and the, uh, the CSA project, uh, SARDC. And similar to what I did with, uh, with SACOM, here's a mapping out of the uh, ISR program over the next uh, 20 odd years. And uh, I've talked about uh, the surveillance from space, the, uh, the DESPI program that'll follow on to, uh, to RCM. AIS, I I even though we're going to uh, have AIS on the, uh, on, on the R RCM uh, constellation, there still is a need for us to get, uh, to continue with some sort of uh, contracted uh, uh, AIS with, with our eventual goal to get uh, consistent, persistent uh, AIS uh, measurements. I, I talked about uh, search and rescue and uh, where we're going with the, uh, with the MEOSAR project and uh, surveillance of space. Uh, I've already mentioned the uh, potential gap that we have with, uh, with Sapphire. Hopefully no gap, but it's a, uh, it's a potential gap and uh, our efforts to move forward with, uh, with a replacement for Sapphire. I'm not gonna spend a lot of uh, time on this slide. I just throw it up as the last slide. And the whole intent here is to, to give you an idea of all the different resources and capabilities and uh, current and future projects that we deal with from, uh, from a space side. So at this point, I guess we'll offer it up for questions. Thanks, Kev. So we are, happy, we are happy to take any questions you want and I'll, I'll just kind of wrap up. So what a great story. Uh, and I had no idea prior to a year ago and I've operated in the benefit of that environment uh, my entire career. Uh, we're gonna give this story to the Space Advisory Board in about a week. Um, we're moving out as fast as we can on our program amongst that entire defense aggressive uh, program uh, and we certainly can't do it without academia, industry, uh, and organizations like Cassiastro to understand, make sure we're going in the right direction and at the right pace and with all the right considerations. So thank you very much.
thank you very much for the three of you. I think uh, you gave a very interesting presentation. I think it gave the audience really a, a possibility to, get a, to gain a better understanding of all your challenges, uh, also a better view of your programs and your plans. And I think these uh, will also in the future present great opportunities for Canadian organizations. So having said that, I think I will turn uh, to uh, questions from the audience. Uh, so if there are some, I hope there will. Okay. Um, Aaron Spance from ABB. So thank you very much for your participation uh, in the in the Cassidy Astro uh, conference. My question is um, more related to the association you guys have with the U.S. with allies. Uh, the U.S. being, of course, the, the biggest user of space and, and technology development. We're seeing a lot of trends that uh, are happening on the civilian side of, uh, of space development. How does that correlate to trends on the military side and how much are, is the Canadian military space influenced by uh, U.S. policy uh, on that side as opposed to um, you know, setting our own Canadian path? So, uh, everybody hear me? Uh, so we're definitely, we're definitely uh, uh, collaborating closely, but uh, uh, we, we respect each other's right to take a different uh, national nuance. Uh, the, the U.S. approach is a, is a bit more bold uh, with the, you know, they've, they've said very, they've stated very clearly and very openly, uh, you touch our stuff in space, we will respond in the time, place, and manner of our choosing. Okay? Uh, and they're not kidding uh, because of all those four C's I talked about. Uh, the Canadian, the Canadian uh, message is we, we will not hesitate to defend and protect our capabilities. Uh, and those two approaches are not incompatible, uh, but they're nuanced you know, nationally. Um, I sometimes get questions about, uh, you know, are we being too aggressive in, in the space message? And, and the analogy I use is, you know, I'll go back to the uh, international waters example. If we have a Canadian frigate on international waters, which we, we as Canadians want to be open and fair access to everyone, and an adversarial ship comes alongside it and starts doing nasty things, we will not hesitate to defend and protect Canadians and Canadian assets. I don't think it's any different in space. Uh, so, absolute deep uh, collaboration built over decades through organizations like NORAD and, the, and to some extent NATO. Um, great collaboration. We each have our own national nuance. We respect each other's kind of different approaches. And when you bring, expand that to the five eyes, there's even more differences. And then when you get into uh, collaboration with countries like Germany, France, and Japan, they have their own approaches as well. So, there's bilateral, there's multilateral. Uh, and there's different organizational cooperation. So we will all decide to what level we will cooperate, but there's no question nobody can uh, operate successfully in this domain uh, if they don't collaborate together. So that's, that's our approach. Yes, sir, if I may add, also to uh, mention the CISPO uh, initiative, the uh, MOU that we have with the Five Eyes, and then uh, there's actually a policy and legal uh, working group under that, uh, that MOU because this is key i mean it's a because it's a global domain and and the impact so there is uh policy advisor lawyers uh very you know involved in having those discussions on what does it mean what are each of the national positions like to make sure we respect each other but at the same time we can still operate together and in, in advance so uh, quite a bit of work in, in that area so absolutely and we do this all the time right i've been on we've all been on missions with our coalitions, allies, partners, and we all come with our different approach and we work, we fi find the best balance and we, and we move forward to the, f to find the win-win opportunities. So we know how to do this. We just need to translate it to the space domain. Any other question from the audience? I think uh, I do have one question. Sure. So it, it was uh, striking to me when you were showing the diagrams with all the circles uh, of the different uh, stakeholders and, and, and participants to the, to the overall effort. Um, that must be a big challenge for just the coordination <coughs> part of that. Uh, is it an area that requires, you know, uh, you're also saying you need to develop the, the, the capability to hire people and is it an area that requires a lot of <laughs> development as well? Don't ask Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so absolutely, and, and I'll let Catherine talk to it shortly, but she's the one that heads up that. But 
That's why we do things like uh, do an audit of all the all those outreach, the, all those requirements, and prioritize it based on government, uh, government and commander's direction on these are the these are the priorities, and we try to manage that. Um, so absolutely, one of the one of the issues we have right now is, you know, this phasing of this defense policy. It really starts next year, not this year. Really, really starts the funding and everything next year. But, but you, we, ha we have to set the conditions to be ready for next year. And one of that is people. So, so of those 120 civilian positions, for example, uh, I'm trying to pull forward five to this year. And it's a struggle uh, because there really is no money until next year. Uh, so, but we're trying to do that to, to, to get from this baseline. I mean, I could argue that DG space wasn't big enough for what it was trying to do before. And, that, and now with this, paint, with this expansion plan, until we can get that expansion started, uh, you know, and we're trying to do that in, in some cases with contract support, trying to pull forward a couple of the civilian positions early so we can get that started. Uh, so absolutely, we need to grow on, on that path and we need to move uh, as quickly as we can to, to support all this, but we're trying, to, we're trying to manage it as we go. Catherine, did you want to add anything? Yeah, so of course, like in the last, like I briefly mentioned, I mean, there's a lot of the engagement that we're doing right now. It's just to increase the awareness, even internally, so that we're hoping that, you know, as we grow our space cadre, uh, there's more education and training throughout that we don't have to do as much as much of that, right? Uh, so there's, there's that aspect, but also, um, you know, in all those interaction uh, where, because I think it's really important that we be, you know, as transparent, like we let people know because ultimately we need everybody in this room to, to make sure that they will be able to achieve what we're set to achieve, right? So there's all these different interaction, but at the same time, they're absolutely key. We're trying to leverage, like now we're under the Air Force, so uh, the Air Force has built, uh, they have a, what they call a global engagement uh, team, right? So leverage what they're doing because now what we find is that uh, every time our command the commander of the air force is talking with his uh, call like his a uh, his a uh, counterpart counterparts in in the, all the other country on the air side they all want to talk space as well right so so uh, we're leveraging those so we don't necessarily have to you know travel to meet to meet them but you know provide the right information so we're trying to leveraging all this in the same with the, the, the OGDs, right? There's different working groups that exist that how, uh, and using those to actually, you know, share a message and then be able to, uh, to move forward. So again, it's, it's a matter of balancing, but at the same time leveraging what's out there and then uh, so we can move forward. So. Yeah. I, I'd just like to add from the, uh, from the project point uh, of view as well, that uh, with all the new SSE projects uh, that we have on the books, if everything's realized, we're probably in the order of about $7 billion. And uh, project director staff within DG Space is probably around seven, eight people. So you're looking at, you know, if you do the math, you're about a billion dollars per uh, one project director, right? So uh, we certainly need to, uh, to expand on the, uh, on the project side as well to support these projects. I think that will be very important, so best of luck with that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, there's a question there. <coughs> uh, it sounds like synthetic aperture radar is becoming very strategic on uh, maybe se several levels. Uh, uh, my group on Michael Turner Project Persephone, Tokyo-based. Um, it's also, I think, significant in disaster relief, which a lot of the major armed forces in the world uh, get involved with. I was uh, on this up personally in 2004, the Asian tsunami in the Indian Ocean. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Carl Long Clausewitz, of course, said famously that war is the continuation of diplomacy by violent means. If you're a deterred force in peacetime, it can be the continuation of diplomacy by nonviolent means, by humanitarian means. Um, I saw this uh, in the relationship between uh, Japan and Indonesia, where for the first time um, uh, Japanese forces deployed abroad in Indonesia uh, in, for disaster relief with this enormous hovercraft, uh, logistical capability that the Indonesians could not possibly uh, scramble at that point. Um, and years later, 2011, a uh, huge tsunami hit Japan, and you had the spectacle of a middle income or low income nation like Indonesia uh, and a former occupied nation 
by Japan uh, to the end of World War II, providing uh, aid and relief and money to a rich country. Um, you know, some hearts have melted somehow. <laughs> and that hovercraft being allowed to make something like landfall was, uh, was a part of it. Um, so uh, my group is increasingly interested in the humanitarian disaster relief implications of synthetic aperture radar. Last summer, uh, I was excited to go to the JAXA Sagami Hara open house to see a, a friend's lab, among other things, uh, where he works on synthetic aperture radar. And I couldn't get in. He wasn't going to show it to me. He couldn't, because recently the Japanese government had decided we need to kind of tighten up here. So here's my question out of all this. Um, can you have operationally responsive release of SAR imagery that you would ordinarily consider too sensitive um, from an intelligence point of view for these kinds of things? Can, do you have an activity that constantly balances the trade-offs between uh, leaving things a bit insecure for a short period of time and saving enough lives to get these diplomatic advantages um, at the international level, uh, the exercise value, of course, for humanitarian disaster relief uh, in the forces themselves, and I think probably even a, a morale benefit in the rank and file from just looking at, look, we killed nobody this year and we saved some lives. So that's my question is, can sure. you, are you thinking at all in terms of the flexibility that's so required to say, okay, we need to be tight now and sometimes a little bit looser. So absolutely, Canadian Forces has a long history in supporting uh, domestic uh, humanitarian and international humanitarian efforts. And we can turn 100% of the space-based capability to su support anything the Armed Forces is involved in, uh, whether it's in Canada or deployed. And here's an example. Uh, last year with the, f last fall, the forest fires in British Columbia, through connections with the uh, U.S. allies, we were we were providing um, uh, imagery from space, uh, IR-based imag imagery from space, tracking uh, the hotspots and passing that information down through forces to to, uh, to government elements on the ground that are working on it. So that's, that's just one example. So absolutely, yeah. Uh, and I would add to that, uh, particularly if we're talking about uh, RCM, the uh, the next uh, SAR uh, capability on board is that uh, even D&D is a user, and I would say the key user, but uh, it's a whole government project uh, led by CSA. So uh, it's not just a D&D &D asset we have to remember, it's a whole government asset. No hard questions, can I? Addition to that question. <laughs> uh, oh, I forgot no, to say. <laughs> yeah. uh, actually, uh, it's probably one of the great uh, opportunities to raise awareness uh, because Canada is actually a founding member, one of three founding members of the International Charter on Space and Major Disasters. And actually, we on regular basis provide uh, radar imagery to all the uh, qualified major disasters in the world. And the Founding members are European Space Agency, CANES, and Canadian Space Agency. Today, that organization uh, includes 18 members, and the last one was uh, United Arab Emirates uh, Space Agency. We'll uh, join it uh, recently. And uh, uh, the last edition, a very welcomed edition, was a Commercial World, it's actually Planet, former Planet Lab, which through US uh, uh, Geological Survey provides, and all of the data is provided for free and in a very responsive way to help uh, disaster relief all over the world. So we can be proud of Canadian achievements in that uh, domain. Thank you very much. So I think we'll stop here. I would like to ask all the audience to join me in thanking the people.